I went and got an office across the street from Madison Square Garden. You did not get an office. It was eleven hundred bucks, but because of the pandemic, it was five fifty five. They slashed it in half, fifty percent off, because they wanted to fill the, the spaces. So you're so I'm over kicking here. my feet up, brother, with money that I didn't even earn. Dumping <laughs> my <laughs> I know. <laughs> so I'm here with Isaiah, a friend, a colleague, a team member, and a confidant. Um, funny enough, I've known you now for we just found out two and a half years. Two and a half years, yeah. The date was June twenty fourth, twenty twenty one. Beautiful. June twenty fourth. Two and a half years, sorry. Yep. Um, part of the whole thing we're doing here with real lives of you know real estate mm -hmm. and what's really caused us to be inspired by this project and really, you know, this, you know, it costs a lot of money, probably not gonna make much money, and that's okay. So we really just want to really celebrate and give space and really, you know, process kind of the stories. You know, the podcast space is so, as you know, I say, right, like saturated with me and you all talk about this. So, you know, so much good content about getting better, making more money, growing yeah. your skill set, the whole nine. Mm -hmm. But there's not really much of an impact on what does it look like to live in the real estate space? Mm -hmm. And even if you're not a real estate professional like us, yeah, real estate's still affecting your life daily, yeah. right? Whether you lived in an apartment growing up or you just bought your first, like, you know, house. Mm -hmm. So question for you is, my favorite question, how I like to open this up is, sure. what, not where are you from, but what did you grow up in? Mm, what did I grow up in? That's a, a deep question. So I grew up in, um, in New York City, kind of... Uh, I wouldn't say it's too, it was too rough. Uh, I grew up on the Upper West Side, kind of like on the uh, border of Harlem, mm. uh, right? So it was like a mix, a lot of Latinos. And uh, I mean, it was fun growing up, to, mm. be, to be honest. Like it was me, my siblings, you know, the people on the block, the whole stuff. It's like the, the, the New York City that people picture like in movies and yeah. like, gets captured. That's kind of like what it is. Really? Um, yeah. So oh, it was, wow. It was fun growing up. You know, we didn't have much money, but I feel like sometimes that makes things like a little more fun, right? It was, it was rough. Um, and may, maybe that's me, like, I guess, uh, coming to terms with like this, the traumatic stuff and kind of wanting to, to make it like an advantage versus a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. But what were you seeing? Like, you know, I'm thinking I don't want to like, you know, no, stairs up here, but I'm like, you know, I'm thinking people on the stoop, you got this yeah. guy grilling, 100%. you got that, you know, Hey mommy, yeah, you know, yeah. like this the, kind of mentality. Is that what you're, is exactly. water, fire hydrant bursts? Brother, the beach chairs were on the block. There was oh, no beach. The beach chairs there were, were beach chairs the, on the stoop. <laughs> No beach in sight. That was the vibe. So the, the hookah, you know, the cigarettes, all the stuff that's wow. like we're trying to get away from now. But then in retrospect, then it was like I was just a kid. And was right? it so a good time, though? Would you say you enjoyed it? Would you recommend it? Would I recommend it? Would I want my kids to go through it? Maybe not so much. Um, but I think like it made me the hungry young man that I am today. Hmm. Right? So I wouldn't I wouldn't change it. Wow. And now let me ask you this. I'm just picturing you. Were you living in an apartment at that time? Where yeah, were you living? An so, apartment building. Yep. Okay, so you grew up in an apartment building. Mm -hmm. mm, did you ever have the house life? Did you ever? Never. The closest thing we had to the house life was like living in a duplex um, in the Bronx. When mm. I, I turned six, my mom moved us out there to the Bronx. Um, but it, it was. It might as well have just been a regular apartment to us. Wow. Yeah. So it wasn't like a house where we kind of had like the single family vibe. Yeah, backyard. Like no, that. never. So you've never had a backyard. Never. Never had a front yard or a backyard. Whoa, yeah. do you know how to mow the lawn? No, I don't even know how to work a lawn. I mean, work a, a, a mower, lawn mower. You don't know what it's called. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, okay, wow. Well, I say that's a trip. Yeah. And would you say that's common with the people you grew up in? They never 100%. have left the, they never left the apartment. Nope. So your real estate, real estate really shaped you. How would you, you know, do you, you guys own, it was like a condo you owned or were your parents? It was an apartment. Yes. Yeah, so we rented. Yeah. Your whole life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm, interesting. That's like, okay. My family, same way. Yeah. How would you say that growing up in these apartments, renting, you know, constantly, mm -hmm. how did that impact your family? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so to be completely honest, um, we were renting at my grandma's and then my mom is a single mom, three kids. So when we moved to the Bronx, it was on section eight. Uh, mm. So she wasn't even paying full rent. I think she was paying like a couple hundred bucks. Did and you know that eight. Yeah. at the time? Yeah. I did. And you were like seven. Mm -hmm. So what was like that memory? Like my mom's not paying rent. Like, what do you think? Um, I think, I think at seven, I was kind of too young to understand it. Um, I think I started to kind of catch wind of it. Like when I was probably like 10, 11, 12. And what were your thoughts around that? Um, it was, it was tough. It was depressing. Right. Cause like as really? a man, you want to, yeah. Like I wanted to help my mom. At right? 10, 11, at 10, 12. I had like the, the fire in me to like do something. Yeah. You tell me at 10 years old, you had that fire in you. Yeah. Tell me more about that. It, it, it's, it would turn into like me, my mom and I would fight a lot. Like when mm -hmm. I was in my like early teens and I think, you know, most 
young men and, and women and their kinda, mothers yeah. yeah and it's because like i was frustrated about where we were like our mm. situation was um and then i only had her to blame right because my dad wasn't there to there blame. physically to blame like i could yeah i could call him and like get a hold of him like it's not like oh daddy was never there kind of situation but he wasn't physically there so the person the adult that like in my head had us in our in this situation was my mom so uh i took a, a lot of like that I guess, anger out on her. And when you say situation, you mean the physical space, literally. Yeah, yeah. Or was there more to it? And like the situation that comes with like, I mean, if you can't afford rent, a lot of times you can't afford a vacation either. Mm, but right. she was, but she was paying, it was section eight. She didn't have to pay rent. Yeah. So I think she was paying like a couple hundred bucks and then section oh, eight, like so her covered co-pay. the rest. Yeah. It was so she wouldn't like even that. pay the copay. So she had, she sometimes had difficulty paying the copay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. And then that scarcity. Wow. So it's so interesting. You were 10, 11, 12 and you saw there was lack. Yeah. And then that lack resulted in a conflict between you and your mother. Mm-hmm. And probably, you know, I'm going to speak like probably a degree of shame in yourself because you're like, 100%. Because, you know, the whole, there's a book, uh, Wild at Heart. I think it's actually over there. Mm-hmm. But it talks about like uh, John Elridge. Yeah. Uh, he talks about like the, um, these phases of masculinity. Mm-hmm. Not really phases, they're like parts of masculinity. But you go from like beloved son to cowboy. From cowboy, you go to warrior, mm. warrior, lover, lover, king, king, sage. Right. So like the, what I find a lot of times, especially with how real estate impacts people, when you're oftentimes being displaced, when you're not really growing up with stability in the household, right? Real estate's usually involved or a consequence of it rather. Yeah. What ends up happening, the beloved son doesn't get a time to really be a beloved son. Mm. Why? Because you know your finances are going down downhill, your dad's out of the picture. And what does you know Isaiah have to do? He needs to go beloved son to king. Mm. You gotta be a king at 10. Yeah, that's deep. At 10, you can't be a king. At 10, you should be a kid. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? But they don't, but because of these, because sometimes, you know, real estate in America is a commodity, mm-hmm. unaffordability, even right now, it's all time high. We got young boys becoming kings wow. when they shouldn't be kings. And you give a king a sword, and then what does he do? He usually goes to what? The lover, before mm-hmm. he even learned how to fight or before he even was a cowboy phase, right? Yeah. Cowboy, you're out there making, you're getting in trouble. You should mm-hmm. be in trouble. You're a cowboy. Yeah. But then you were over there 11, I can't believe you were that aware, honestly. Yeah. 11, 12, boom, you knew like, man, there's something lacking here. We're not where we should be f- representative of the physical apartment space. Yeah. And how big was the apartment for a single mom and three kids? Honestly, I, I couldn't tell you the square footage. Like I knew nothing about how real many, estate at the time. Do you know time. how many bedrooms? Yeah, it was two bedrooms, one so bath. So it was one bed for your mom, one bedroom for three kids. Yep. One bed, so wow. it was my little sister. It was my big brother, my little sister. My little sister was with my mom. So it was their room, and then wow. it was me and my brother's room. And where would you live? Like in bed with her or in the side bed? Yeah, in bed with her. And then we like constructed a uh, like a room for her like towards the end of our our time at the at the apartment, which she never slept in. It was basically like a storage unit. Whoa! But really, you guys had three kids, two bedrooms. Yeah. Well, four, one adult, three kids, two bedrooms. Mm-hmm. Was that common in the Bronx, in the city? Yeah, yeah. That from from my like. So what's funny is, and then. Coming back to what you said about being aware that young, I think it was because I went to a middle school that was predominantly, like I'm going to speak candidly, it was like a predominantly white school in a white mm-hmm. area. It was on the Upper West Side. Um, so mm-hmm. I was like so close to people that clearly were living a different life than I was, mm-hmm. right? But then I would go home to the South Bronx. Oh, Yeah, so it was like this dichotomy wow. of like, I'm spending all day with people who are like, can afford to get Shake Shack for lunch and like, I'm getting like a butter bagel, right? Um, and you're just constantly being reminded there's a difference here. Correct. And even you moving physical spaces. Yeah. And how would you get to the what for West Side? We would, my mom would wake up at like five, six in the morning, <coughs> drive us to um, school, all of us. So she would drop my brother off on high school, uh, drop me off in middle school, and then drop my sister off. And it was so like, going back to the shame part you mentioned, like it was so shameful for me. There was a certain point where I would tell my mom to like drop me off a couple blocks away from school just so like they didn't see what kind of car she was driving. Wow. It goes deep. Yeah. Deep. And you see how the real, I, I hate to say, I keep bringing this in, but I'm like, even I'm just picturing young Isaiah, you know, this young beloved son who never really got the chance to stay beloved, who was given the sword and thrown into the, you know, the war. Yeah. Right. Ba ba ba, taking bullets left mm-hmm. and right. And then you're out here and you're really changing spaces. Yeah, literally. Right? Yeah, architecturally. Mm-hmm. Right? Even the material of the buildings. Bronx, lower, right? Upper West Side, higher quality construction. Yeah, that's right? a good point. Yeah. You're experiencing what? high. You're probably walking through high-end new builds, right? Mm-hmm. 
They wouldn't do high back then. They definitely weren't doing no high and new builds in Bronx. No, definitely not. Now they are. Now they are, of course. Yeah, but but yeah. even then, like, and well, and then on a positive note, you had the exposure. Mm-hmm. And I think that's one of the best things, honestly, about the city that you can go in different areas because it does open up your mind. It opens yeah. up your mind. And yeah, there was coming from a bad place, but real estate really did. But man, real estate's crazy, especially when you think about schools. Yeah, it goes so deep. Wow, tell me. What do you? What kind of impact did it have seeing that kind of wealth? And did you were you ever able to go to where your friends in that school lived? Did yeah. you ever see their apartments? Great question. This is actually a funny story. I don't know how many times I've actually told this story. Um, I had a, a not not really a friend of mine. He was in a lower grade. His name was Mac. Mac. I never forget it. He lived Mac on the Upper West Side. He had uh, his parents had like a brownstone on Riverside Drive, and it was like a three floor brownstone. They owned all three floors. His house had an elevator, <laughs> and I remember I had like a. Do you remember the rumor? The, uh, it was yeah. like a cell phone, the slide out rumor. I had like a rumor too. <laughs> throwback, right? The throwback. I had a rumor. I remember going into this kid's house and I'm like, this guy has an elevator and everyone's like, I felt like an outlier, right? Because he wasn't really a friend of mine. I think it was like a mutual friend. So I go into this guy's house and I'm like, everyone's just like hanging out like, oh, this is Max's house. And this is my first time at his house. I get into the elevator. I take the rumor out, brother. I start snapping photos of this man's house. Yeah. And now thinking about it, like it's kind of embarrassing. Yeah. And it was probably telling of like where I come from, but that's just how astounded I was at where I was like, what is this? Did Mac know you were taking the pics? Hopefully not. Like, okay, gotcha. <laughs> hopefully gotcha. I don't, but I, I think I was so like immersed in what was happening. Like I didn't even, it, no one, I was in, in that house alone. I might as well have been. Wow. It was just me and my cell phone just taking photos. Like this is a museum. Whoa. Crazy. And you got to think this guy at the time, probably a few million Right, the house? Yeah, this kid was probably three like... three-story brownstone in the Upper West Side? Oh, my God. Insane. Definitely millions, for yeah, sure. What are we now, talking about? I would love Back to know then. what it's worth now. Oh, yeah. it's Well, he's a pretty penny, this guy, Mac, if you're out there. We Mac, do, shout out to Mac. Shout out to Mac. If you need, if you need a realtor, I'll get my New York license. Um, <laughs> no, but even then, I think that's a great, great... And honestly, a great example of how real estate impacted you. Because yeah. you just saw a physical space. That's all you saw. Mm-hmm. You saw a physical space... A home, yeah. right? And it shaped not only how you saw the world, mm-hmm. but how you saw Mac. Didn't you see Mac differently after yeah, that? Yeah, I was like, yeah, his parents are definitely loaded. His parents are definitely loaded, which then what, it made you reshape how you talk to Mac. It made you reshape those encounters. And I think that's a big thing, how real estate really does impact us in our everyday lives. It's that when we walk into spaces, it doesn't necessarily mean luxury. It could even be like a aesthetically, yeah. right? Or like a zen, mm-hmm. right? Feng shui, it has a profound impact on how we view the person who's the creator or the owner yeah. right, for the time being of the space. So true. Wow. So, okay. So, okay. Fast forward. And that, that was high school or? That was middle school. Okay. So where'd you go to high school? High school. I went to high school also in the Upper West Side. Um, I went to high school in the Brandeis Wealth? building for all my. Wealth, wealthy or? Well, or was um, it? More diverse this one. Yeah. This was, this was definitely less wealthy than the middle school I went to. Uh, more, you know, dynamic range of like kids from different walks of life. Um, but it, it was, it was in the same vicinity, right? So mm-hmm. it was like less than a mile walk from my middle school. So it was like the same, I was seeing the same things, right? Outside of school. Uh, I was probably cutting, cutting a school a little more at the time to like do extracurriculars. Um, but okay. kind of the same vibe. Okay. So, and would you say there was a massive real estate impact there or not so much? You kind of say multi Not so much. No, nah, I think that was, I was probably like just, numb to it at that point. It was just it was just my reality, you know, mm-hmm. when I would be at school. Okay. Now did you go to college? I did go to college. Where at? Yeah, I went to college at BMC. I, know that. I don't know how to do that. Yeah, I started <laughs> I started college at a community college because like high school I was just doing everything but focusing on school. Okay. Um went to college at BMCC in Tribeca. Um and it's pause, pause, pause. You yeah. were not paying attention in high school? Not at all. You seem like a very studious young man. I am I guess smart, intelligent, but it just I, I didn't I didn't care like in high school. Didn't I, care. I didn't care. But what about, about that drive? You said you had the drive. Oh, I yeah. grew up with you know. You know, I was heavily like into music at the time, so I had like this oh, big I dream. Forgot. Yeah, yeah, I had this big dream of like being a rapper, and I, I mean, it may still happen. Where did for that me. come from? I don't think it's gonna happen uh, for you. I just want to make that's one more. I, I appreciate that. Let's kill that dream. The haters are my motivators. The haters are your motivators. Let me tell you but, something. I hate on I hate on the, the dream. I love the man. Yeah, I respect it. Hate the dream, love the man. Love that. With that being said, where did that come from? Because uh, you just kind of skipped over this young rapper Isaiah. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
when I was six, um, this was like 50 Cent era, right? So I was born in, I'm a 96 baby. Okay. So in 2002, like Get Rich or Die Trying drops, I'm six years old. And like, I have an older brother, right? Mm -hmm. So I was um, exposed to a lot of stuff that maybe a six-year-old without an older sibling um, would have would have not gotten exposed to, right? Because I'm getting put on like to game, basically. So it's like, yo, put on these headphones. Back when like you would put the CD in the CD player and then you would hit next on the button. Uh, my brother was also a big music head, so. And what got him into music? Um, I think it was probably, obviously like the quality of the music kind of just catches you, right? I think music was mm -hmm. just a, a lot better back then. Um, it could just be like me getting older, but I think it was also kind of like him wanting to get away from his own reality and trauma. Like, not to get super deep, but I think it was his escape mm. um, from his, uh, I guess, running away from the stuff that he just didn't want to uh, confront. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So that's how you got put on. So that's why in high school you were doing your own thing. College, you'd kind of bring it on with you. Well, now, did you have a lot of friends in high school that were about the music life too? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Popular city life. Okay, cool. So when you, you grad, how old are you now, Isaiah? I I'm 27. Know. 27. When did you yeah. graduate college? Graduated, graduated college. Yeah, I graduated like a couple years ago. It took me like four years to finish like a two-year program at BMCC. Okay, so again, you my like graduated like 22, 23. I graduated college when I was 25. Okay, wow. Very yeah. interesting. Million-dollar question. Talk to me. I got, you know, me and you connected. Great story there. Mm -hmm. But tell me about what got you into the real estate industry. Mm. Where were you? What was the click? What did yeah. you see? You know, you're you're just starting your career, right? Yeah. What does it look like? Yeah. So I was working at a uh, furniture rental space, kind of just like lifting lifting things up and putting them down, just like the commercial would say, right? And uh, I was just like unhappy with the amount of money I was making, and I was just like, I need to be making more money. How much were you making? I was probably making like twenty an hour, give or take, before taxes. Slim. No, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was doing all right. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So it, I was getting frustrated, mm -hmm. and then at the time I was dating my my girlfriend, still my girlfriend Eden. Big shout out to Eden. Um, I was dating her, and I kind of love the, Eden. Can we just give her another? Yeah, shout big, out? big, big, great brother. Eden. If you're listening, we love you. Amazing. Ten out of ten. Ten out of ten. Um, so I'm in the car with her mom, actually mm -hmm. Grace. Shout out to Grace GB. I don't know you, Grace, but I'm Grace. sure you're good too. Another legend. Another legend. So I'm in, I'm sitting uh, passenger seat right next to Grace, right? and I'm like, she's like, "How's work?" And I'm like, "I mean, it's going okay. Like, I feel like I need to be making a lot more money." I was frustrated. Oh wow, you even went low with the voice. You you, you even stopped enunciating out there. Yeah. You went, <laughs> uh, yeah, like, yeah. Okay, so tell me. And then Grace goes, um, "Why don't you just try and make some money outside of outside of the job you're working?" And something just clicked, and I was like, "I." She said, "Outside of the job," but what I heard was outside of a job, right? So something clicked. Where I was like, "Making money outside of." like the person that you're being employed by like mm. and this i was 23 and i was like hmm so i started you know youtubing you know how to make money the first thing that like i thought of was like maybe like an etsy store or something something like low because you are artistic yeah so like in, in in retrospect it was like low leverage of course but i was like okay etsy store what can i do right so youtube and then i come across a youtube video on uh the breakfast club with this guy um mark witten which is like mm. a, a big wholesaler i think out of baltimore at okay. the time this was like four or five years ago and he was just telling people about wholesaling, right? The like the concept of flipping a contract, not flipping the house. And I was like, hmm, this sounds simple enough. So I bought his course. I think it was like a, a couple hundred bucks. And I was hooked. I caught the bug. As soon as I, I understood the concept, I'm like, I can do this. It was that simple. And then I just hit the ground running from there. Started marketing, SMS, whatever I had to do, calling people, um, just to get in front of people to see if I could lock up a deal under, like at a discounted price. Mm. And... Can I ask you a question? Please. I guess but you're on the podcast, so I definitely can ask you a question. <laughs> um, realistically, though, you just made it seem very simple. Yeah. Nothing is that simple in the podcast. No. No, it's a podcast. In the real estate world, or in any life, what, was, what goes from YouTube to pushing you into you know, paying the SMS, paying all those things? Do you have to pay for courses? What were people saying about that? Like, what was that really like pragmatically life in real life? What were, did you have to, did you lose time with Eden? Like what happened? Yeah. Yeah. So the first question was what pushed me to that? What pushed me to that is like poverty, right? I was just tired of being broke. I was like, I need more money. I want to live like, I want to live like Mac. But there was like, oh, you want to live like Mac? Yeah. Or like his parents were living. Wow. I want that for my family. Cause like we, we've been through so much. I'm just like, um, I'm tired of this. So you wait, no, very big move here. 
So still though, you go from no real estate, you have no friendship in real estate, you have mm-hmm. no one pushing you. Yeah. You get make money outside of the job. You heard make money outside of a job. A job yeah. What leads you to that? I'm trying to say like what on YouTube you're going, you hear the mm-hmm. Breakfast Club, but still, what pushes you to do it yourself? Like how? How'd you do it? I think it was just like again, like your environment, right? Like I I wanted and what what's there's a I guess like a a story or like a metaphor. I think you brought it up about like the mouse who wants to f- not feel pain more than they want the cheese, mm. right? So it's like what you're running away from sometimes can be more of a motivator than yeah. what you're running towards, mm. right? Yeah, it was a study. I forgot where it was out of, but basically what they did is they tied this like rope or something to the mouse, the tail of the mouse. Yeah. And they put the smell in like a little like tube. So the mouse couldn't turn left or right. They could only pull forward. Mm-hmm. And they basically put the smell, they whiffed the smell of cheese to the to the, um, the mouse or the rat. Actually, yeah. not mouse, rat. So they basically tied this rope and they tie, they w- put in the ventilation, the smell of cheese. And the rat starts pulling, pulling, pulling. I want that. I want that. I want that. Then... They flip it, right? And maybe it hits like a certain, you know, X amount of strength yeah. on the tug, on the rope. They flip it and they put this, they put a smell of like a predator, like let's say a cat or something, mm. right? Behind the mouse. And the mouse thinks, holy crap, I'm going to die here. Yeah. I'm afraid. I don't want to get eaten alive. So it starts running for dear life and it like ran that rope, right? And it's always going to show you like we will run exponentially harder for the things that cause us pain mm. than for the things that we desire yeah so it's like always like folks the fear and like pain are such great motivators yeah and yeah it's tough hormozy talks about that all the time he's like use use it like whatever it is if it's not motivation if if the motivation is pain use it whatever you Mm -hmm. got like for him it was like his his uh disdain for like the way his father kind of you know put so much pressure on him and for me it was just like being broke Mm -hmm. and because i was exposed to like wealth every day but it was it was like this close but I, i just couldn't i couldn't yeah. I touched it, but I couldn't experience it. Yeah. Oof. It's it was so, light years away from you, but it was inches away from you. Exactly. And wow. that was just like enough. So as far as pragmatic, I mean, like I, I followed Mark Witten's course. I think he was like, you know, go on, you know, How this much website. was the course? It was a couple hundred bucks. Okay. And you paid for it, no doubt. Yeah, no doubt. Nice. With the, um, with the warehouse money that I was making, <laughs> lifting with my legs. But Come uh, on. Yeah, just grinding it out, figuring it out, and just feeling like, hey, whatever it is, I don't care. And how long was it before you got your first... So how oh. long would you start? Were you doing it full time or just part time at the time? I was doing it part time. Part time, okay. Did you have any dialers? Any what, what were you doing? No, no, no. I was I was bootstrapping it. So I was calling from my actual cell phone. Okay. Uh, my my new no York leverage, number. zero leverage. Oh, you were negative caveman. leverage. You were caveman out there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, cell phone, um, pulling. I was I was rocking the the calling from the CSV. No CRM, just Google Google Sheets. Mm. You know, if someone picked up and they were semi interested, I'm highlighting the the column green. That kind of thing. If someone curses me out, I'm highlighting the column red. And you learned what to say from that course? Well, how did I learn what to say? I think um, it was a, a script, TTP script, Brent Daniels. Oh, the, TTP. You know yeah, TTP? Of course. Oh, my god. TTP, baby. That is, I think they. I think Leverage really use a lot of their stuff. Mm. Yeah, okay. Wow. Brent, shout out to Brent Daniels. He's a legend. Oh, he know that guy's very... Yo, that guy's a killer. Kill, Insane. Killer, 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 killer. Now, let me ask you this. Where, I guess, and now, where did we... Kind of get connected because I think I got introduced to you right around there. Well, yeah. how did you find out about me? Yeah, because so, it was on Zillow, right? It was that mm-hmm. I picked up the Zillow. You were a Zillow inbound call, not even a lead. What, yeah. what was it exactly? Yeah, so fast forward to what is this, the year of 2021? 2021. I started Great to year. gain some traction. Um, this was like not post pandemic, this was kind of still in the middle of the pandemic, right? We're one year into the pandemic. Unemployment, I had gotten laid off from the uh, the job that I was working. It happens, all right? Collecting unemployment. The craziest thing, and I'm sure so many, so many people can relate to this, unemployment was paying at a certain point people more than they've ever seen in their entire life. Like it was an extra 600 bucks on top of like what you're getting base. And it just changed the chemistry of a lot of people's brains out there to say like they weren't working and they were making more money than they would have if they worked 40 hours at their job. Basically, they got, they, 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 unemployment, was, unemployment was 100% where you, if you lost your job pandemic, they kept, they paid you 100% of what you were making? No, no, no. They So it was like a, a, a pandemic surplus, right? So it was like because of the pandemic, we're going to mm-hmm. pay you more. So we're going to pay you a certain percentage of what you would get at the job plus an extra because we understand that there's really like no work out there. So um, how much were people making? Me personally, I was getting like 900 bucks a week. A week? A week. 
Don't tell, like, don't tell people out here. What? Like clockwork, right? I didn't have to lift anything. No, no lifting, no putting it down. No. And you were getting the same amount of money. I was getting more. Oh my god. So think about what this does to somebody's like psyche. Yeah, this is not good for this is not good for people. Brother, I went and got I went and got an office across the street from Madison Square Garden. You did not get an office across the street. It was eleven hundred bucks, but because of the pandemic, it was five fifty five. They slashed it in half, fifty percent off because they wanted to fill the, the spaces. So you're so I'm over kicking here. my feet up, brother, with money that I didn't even earn. Crazy. Dumping <laughs> my I know. <laughs> <laughs> what yeah crazy is this true 100 percent. where was i why did i well, I, was, I was making really good money yeah, you, were, you were on the other side of the phone brother. yeah i was on the other side of the, yeah i was uh i was not in, you know but at the same time you want to be sensitive people really did have a drastic time i think i had a really difficult time with the pandemic i'm gonna be mm. honest my family was very I, i'm not, i did not get vaccinated more power to you to those who were vaccinated <laughs> yes i'm out here but uh, my family, you know, I'd lost like 30 deals or 40 deals in a matter of two and a half months mm. of the first like April and May, yeah. in March, April, May of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. My business was like, everything was terrifying. People panicked. I panicked. Yeah. And I remember hearing from like grown men that were in the industry longer than I could, I was born and they were like, this is the end of the world. Mm. So it was very fearful. My family would call me, listen, you're being responsible. Don't go back in the office. This is June, July. And I would just tell them like, listen, if you call me again. <laughs> if you call me again, I had a serious conversation with my brother Bruce and Brian. I said I was very, very aggressive. So I, that I need apologies for. Mm. I said, I do not care. Do not wow. tell me not go in the office. Do not tell me to get vaccinated. I am only focused on me surviving this and my small business surviving this. The wow. end. That was where my beginning and my end care went. At the same time, we did a lot of good things for the community, in my opinion. We gave away like thousands of free masks. We gave away like six thousand or seven thousand dollars of gas for the local first responders and here in Newark. So we did, you know, we did want to give back, but it was that like it was just so intense. My yeah. family especially was so intense mm -hmm. and about like being vaccinated, not going to office, staying home. Yeah. That I was just like, screw this, I gotta go hunt. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did. And that's actually 2021. That's the year to this day that I've made the most income. Wow. It was 2021. Mm. So that was the best, highest net year for me in the history of the company, everything. That was like my money year. Now, since then, I've made a lot of equity plays, whatever. Yeah. But that was like the highest amount. I made a ton of money. And it was just funny because I hear the other side of script. Mm -hmm. And my experience in 2021 was so different yeah. than a lot of people. So, mm -hmm. okay. So, wait. I still don't know. How do I, you and I get connected? Yeah. So, I have a little bit of money. Though I, it wasn't earned money, but it was money that I got to play with, right? Mm -hmm. So, kind of, I was running Facebook ads, doing a bunch of stuff. You know, short story long, I get a, a deal under a property under contract. It's a three family in Newark, South, I think it was South 8th Street. Your memory. This guy is incredible. And, um, I call, and I'm like, at the time, I, I worked so hard on the acquisition side, like getting the contract. I'm like, I don't care if I have to split this thing 50-50 with like the, on, on the disposition side, mm -hmm. meaning like getting it sold. Let me call an agent and see if they have a buyer for this property. I'll split it. I don't care how many ways, as long as I can just get paid and get proof mm -hmm. of concept. So I go on Zillow, type in the zip code that the property is located in. And I think you were the first agent to pop up. Wow. Yeah. And I was like, oh, this guy looks kind of sharp. Wow. So I call the number and I think, um, yeah, you pick up. It's like, hey, this is Brenda Silva. And I explained the whole thing to you. Yeah. And I was like, and at that time I had been working with leverage. So I was so familiar with wholesaling. Mm. Yeah, beautiful. And I think I would, I, and it's funny too, because I used to like always be careful with the phones. But I remember when you called me that day, I was on the road mm. and I was like, this guy just seems like a like genuine guy. Mm. And I remember thinking that from the first, like from the rip. I wow. was like, this guy seems like a genuine guy. I could tell you had just started. I felt it, right? Because at that point, I was already sharp as a tack. Yeah, yeah. And I've been exposed to leverage. These guys are like sharks, mm -hmm. right? So like hearing the difference, I was like, oh, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, okay. Then what? Yeah, so we're talking on the phone. One thing that stood out to me about you was that you did not pull punches. Like, you were just straight, like, hey, mm -hmm. like, are you crazy? Like, you are you got to be careful out here. Like, you're getting these properties under contract. You don't know what you're doing. Like, you, you're dead. And I told you, like, the price that I got it locked up at. And you were like, oh, my, are you nuts? Like, this is way too high. This is never going to sell. And though many people would probably be, like, like it would be a shot to their ego, I was like, mm -hmm. I love that this guy is just keeping it 100,000% honest mm -hmm. with me. So I was like, okay, this is definitely somebody I got to keep close. Wow. Yeah. It was the realness. The realness. And isn't that funny when we talked about the podcast, what we just say, hey, the best thing you can do on this podcast is, you know, I was like, if you really want to, is just be yourself. Just be honest. Yeah. Just be honest. And people don't want to hear the be honest, but it was just like yesterday, I was talking to one of the agents and he was, I was like, he want to take off a, a certain day of the week, right? Mm. And I said, you know, honestly, you don't need to take a certain day off of the week. He's like, well, I'm working Saturday and Sundays. I said, if you want my honesty, like, you just got to stop being friendly with people mm. at the office. You just wow. got to work until 2 p.m. 
and lock in the end. You don't need a day off. You need mm. to just be efficient. Mm. Like there's no reason why you got to be at the office as a realtor past two. Wow. At past one o'clock, two o'clock, you should be out there on the field. That's a reality. Yeah. Talk about no, it. But you got to be efficient with your time. Yep. And what's efficient with your time? It's not, it, it's each zone too. Mm-hmm. An hour lunch, it's a quality of life. Yeah. For me, I'd rather have that an extra half hour with my kid mm. or on the phone or with my wife mm-hmm. or with my pastor or with my brother. I love y'all. I love my family more. You know yeah. what I mean? So it's like, uh, but being brutal with him, I said, honestly, here you go. And it was so cool because I've known this man. He's a, I really, 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 really see a lot of value in him. Yeah. I see he has a bright future. Very sharp. And I see what I realized about him is he's come to a place where he's coachable. Mm. What does coachable mean? Coachable doesn't mean you just listen. That's not coachable. Coachable means you put into action. Yeah. You follow the instruction. Mm-hmm. That is coachable. Yeah. It's not coaching. If a coach comes to you mid-game, you know, let's say you're playing basketball, he says, hey, I need you to pass the ball more. And the whole rest of the game, you're like, you're, you say, yes, coach. Wow, great advice. I can't believe, man, you're so smart, coach. And then you do not pass the ball. Guess what that is? You're not coachable. Not coachable. And if you, in this industry, when you see, and I'm just going to be blunt, like where I'm at in my career path right now and where I see real estate really impacting these guys and, uh, and girls and young women and older women and with the whole night, right? I'm not like trying to like... yeah. <laughs> say anything about sex here but my point is this you gotta real estate can have such an amazing profound impact because if you can learn to be coachable in your industry and in your career mm-hmm. you can bring that same coachable that same humble spirit to your marriage to your family to your community and it allows you to really it allows real estate to go through the seams because if you're not listening at work you're definitely not going to listen when you have the argument with your spouse yeah wow yeah, and absolutely. it's true, and you've seen it too, right? Mm-hmm. And you're like, oh, well, I don't really. Uh, it, real, this stuff is all pragmatic. All this real estate stuff. Okay, so then we end up getting together. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. We start. I remember, th- if I may, would you want to tell the Cuban Pete story? Yeah, I can tell it. So you were late. <laughs> mm-hmm. I was late. Um, but I was like, you know, hanging out across the street waiting for you. You, you come through. Uh, I sit down. I remember Wait, like, what, was what I was the reason wearing. of this Cuban Pete story. Oh, the Cuban Pete. I closed my. We closed our first deal together. Well, yeah, we closed our first deal. You had a finder's fee. Finder's fee, right? We want to talk it about was how nominal. much it was. Uh, what was the amount? It was like twenty five fifty. Okay, not that nominal. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but, but it was the proof of concept. Right? Oh, yeah, it was, and that it was, was the, the first money you had made. First dollar I ever made in real estate. Okay, let's really go here. So, real estate's impact. I just want to make sure it's clear because we're yeah. getting more like business stuff and not so like how it impacted you. Mm-hmm. You haven't. You've been working for at that point. What it was probably like almost a year. Six you mean months. in real estate? Yeah, in trying in real estate before oh, you made two money. Two years. At that time, no. I, I did Mark Witten's course in June. I started my LLC June of 2019. You're telling me you did two, two years, years of real estate, nothing. How did that impact you as a man seeing no gratification for two plus years? To, I would have told you to quit. Yeah. Um, I think it was just, again, like not having maybe the easiest financial life. It was like, oh, it was just more of, more of the same. Right. It was just like, I got to just keep going. I knew there was light at the end of the tunnel. Right. So that's what kept me going. It's like and, and here's the thing is when you when all you see is like poverty or when mm-hmm. when when, you know, below 50 grand a year is just a norm. It's like that. That's the lens in which you see the world from. So me. Whoa. Me not making a dime in two years. I knew that a lot of it was mindset. A lot of it was me starting and stopping, starting and stopping. Oh, if Facebook ads doesn't work, then I'm going to. And that is why poor people, I think, stay poor is they cannot like put their head down for a year or two or three years and see nothing and and still be positive that something is going to come of it. Mm. Right. So they just want the instant gratification. Yeah, I think, look, there's a holistically on a really like a macro system, systematic, systemic issue there is poverty right yeah and even like christ says like we're always gonna have to pour mm-hmm. horrible reality yeah with this being said there are pragmatic things we can do to elevate our positions yeah. where it's like that you got to delay the gratification mm-hmm. as much as possible in the right steps right sure so you say well look i'm gonna do light and tunnel i'm gonna stay lifting things up and putting things down for the next mm-hmm. 30 years mm-hmm. my friend you're gonna get you're gonna get broke i'm telling yeah, you the with truth, a, right? with a broke back broke back broke body broke back <laughs> broke pockets broke back mountain you <laughs> know what i mean so with that being said um, that's funny, but <laughs> I think it is cool. So what did that first amount of money, what did that make you feel when you got that 2500 I pay you check or card? What did I pay you with? Uh, cash. cash. <laughs> so I pay you cash, Cold cash hard. money, young money. Yeah. So when I paid you the cash, 
Um, I shouldn't have paid you cash. It probably is not good. But when I paid you cash, um, I can't believe I paid you cash. But anyways, when I paid you cash, what kind of impact did that have for you? I was crying Making like a first baby. money. I remember I got into the car. And, after uh, dinner? Yeah, after we ate. Oh, lunch, yeah. I got into the car. Uh, it was like a, a zip car or like an enterprise rental, right? Because we're from New York. You right? rented a car to come to, out come to yeah. lunch to, collect to some, get the money. Collect the bread. You got to. So, uh, yeah. So I got in the car. I was crying. Like a, I call Eden, the first person mm. I call. She starts crying. I'm not even, I haven't even cried yet. That's when I knew I was like, this girl is just, you're, she, you're crying for me. I love her. Because she's like, oh, I, like, I just see like how hard you work. If she and had I was a like, sister, I would say we got we to gotta hook her up with Chris Lugo downstairs. <laughs> she, has a, she has a sister. She has a sister. Shout out to Renee. Renee's taken. Shout out to Renee. Renee. Oh, so she. They're a happy couple. If it doesn't work out. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> so she starts crying. And I'm like, ah, oh, like I'm still kind of like in shock. Like this really happened. She's like, yeah, how, how was meeting Brendan, this and that. And I was like, yeah, it was great. And we eventually hang up. And then you connected me with David Choi. I don't know if you remember. You put us in a group chat. Ah, uh, yes. And then David was like, hey, or you were like, uh, David's going to call you at mm-hmm. a certain time, whatever. Uh, because I could see that you were like such a great, and, I, and once again, the real estate, I think it shaped you and the way it's impacted you is just gave you the opportunity to experience delayed gratification, to experience mm. hard work with no payout. Yeah. And it shaped you into a man who not only had the drive to get out of poverty, but it really gave you the character to get out of poverty. Mm. You know That's what I mean? Deep. Yeah. And now, now you got even more growing to do, right? Mm-hmm. To be like, okay, what is the, you know, to really get into that you know, be, do, have, that we mm-hmm. talk about here at Keller Williams, right? Yeah. Um, but then, okay, you talk to David, yada, 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 blah, 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 blah. I'm crying. Crying. I'm missing exits, right? I'm talking to David, and he's like, brother, you know, what's going on? And I'm like, I'm crying like a little baby. And um, and, and I'm, I'm driving back to the city, but I'm not paying attention to the GPS because I'm like in the conversation with David. Yeah. And you have 2,400. I have 2,500 cold hard cash sitting You've in my pocket. you counted like seven times. Ten. And I'm just like, I'm Choi I'm, is hyping you up. I'm hyping me up. And I'm missing, ex- literally, I'm missing exits. I'm like driving to nowhere, <laughs> right? Just having a conversation. <laughs> and it was honestly one of the most beautiful moments of my life. Cause it's wow. like, wow, like it, it felt like a, a weight, like, like I accomplished something without, you know, not necessarily without help because you helped me, right? No, no, no. You accomplished something without help, man. Yeah, I mean, I yeah. I was a part of the transaction, sure, yeah. but like the listing agent didn't help the buyer's agent. Yeah, yeah. I, I maybe I coach you through it a little bit, mm-hmm. but yeah. And it was my first dollar or my first, I guess, significant amount, I guess, mm-hmm. of money like that I made outside of a job. Wow. It was that like it, it was almost like it came out of thin air. It freed you. It freed my mind. Real estate freed your mind. Yeah, it really real did. estate liberated you. It really did. It continues you, to every day. Red pill, blue pill, baby. <laughs> Took the red pill. Ain't looking back. Mm, not at all. Born out. Welcome. Neo, Happy you to are be the here. chosen one. Thank you. Save us. <laughs> Zion. No. Um, wow. I feel like Morpheus. No, I'm just kidding. But because um, I didn't even put you on. It was kind of like, you know, Eden's mom, low key. was Low tri- key. And Eden's kind of like Trinity. Trinity, wow. you know, These, have you watched Matrix? I, you know what's funny is I got to go back and watch the Matrix. The first one, of course, was my favorite movie outside of like the mask, Jim Carrey. I love one of the best that movies ever. Movie ever. What? Cuban Pete's. Do you remember that wow. scene? Wow. Dun, 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 dun. Are we talking about the same scene? Yes. The Cuban Pete's is a club. Cuban Pete. I don't know if Cuban Pete's was a club in the movie, but there was a song. I think it's a song. They call me Cuban Pete. Oh yes, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Oh wow. In the scene. Not only that, and then he does a dun, 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 yep. when the cops are about to arrest him. Exactly, and then the cops start dancing. Yes. So between that and the Matrix, I don't know. What, I gotta go back and watch the Matrix because I haven't watched it in probably like twenty years. But for some reason, I was like enamored with that movie when I was young. I was like, you know, put it on, put it on. And I was like, okay. So but, fast forward from yes. the movie time. The point is, you got the money, you're happy. Mm-hmm. Now, can I share a story about you coming onto the team? Please. Okay, so you are an inbound sales agent mm-hmm. or inbound sales associate, whatever you want to call it. Inside sales agent. Inside sales agent. I say, yeah. Yeah, the way I would I say, really, it's like telemarketing, handling inbound and outbound. Mm-hmm. You've helped a lot with tech. You have a bright future. Thank My, you. Always, I, you know, I always believe in you, and I always want to say, how can I get this guy to you know, 100K as soon as possible? That's always what I want to do. Like, how can I get you 100, 150? Like, what can I do to help you make more? And by you making more, that means you created for the company more, right? Mm. Um, even thinking of bonuses, the road to 12, mm-hmm. you know, listings a month, the whole night. With that being said, I want to share how you came on the team. Yeah. So I had hired a guy. He was a nut job for the same position. That's the nice way of saying it. Being last. Mm-hmm. If you're listening, you know, not, it's not for everybody. Yeah. 
And we're a little bit nuts too. So it's not like, you mm. know, there's no judgment, just like the truth. Yeah. You're nutty. I'm nutty. Sometimes, you know, two nuts go together. Sometimes mm-hmm. two nuts don't go together, right? Almonds and macadamia, right? Yeah. Keep, you know, to your own kind. Mm-hmm. Um, with that being said, I'm calling you one night at like nine o'clock. I know 920. I call you. I say, Isaiah, do you have a minute? You say, yes, of course. Of course. Brendan, what's going on, my friend? Any deal? Right. Uh, maybe this is all Teresa. <laughs> Right, one of our uh, uh, leads. Right, shout out to yeah. Teresa Holder. Um, no, but reality is, I call you and say, hey, can I be honest with you? You say, yes. I said, I don't think you should be a wholesale. Mm. I don't think wholesale's for you, man. You are too great. Uh, for me, this is how I see wholesale. I'm going to be very blind to all my wholesalers out there. I love you. Mm-hmm. This is my general experience of the industry of wholesaling. You know, now it's more innovations. Wholesaling is like super cutthroat. It is like, the you know, it's very boiler room. Mm-hmm. Right, it's a lot. Of, you can make it look pretty, whatever you want to do. But now I've been exposed for it for so long. Yeah, it is like if you're not super transparent and super honest, and you don't have a cold-hearted like killer instinct, mm-hmm. you're not going to be a good wholesaler. Yeah, that's what I've just determined. You mm-hmm. really got to be sharp as attack, and you got to be just any sales. You got to be sharp as attack. Yeah, but you got to really be able to just not empathize. Mm-hmm. Or be so in tune with emotions, like in a manipulation sense, that you can rock and roll. Mm. But it's this wholesaling is usually about you. And people say, well, it's a win win, win win. Okay. Yeah. But it's, it is a more dirty business than traditional retail. That yeah. is my view. Mm-hmm. Some popular. I partner with wholesale. I love my wholesalers, but this is my view. Yeah. With that being said, I tell you the same thing. And I tell you, hey, Isaiah, this is not for you. You, mm-hmm. I see you as. You're not a shark. You're not a wolf. Mm-hmm. If you want to be a wholesaler, you have to be a wolf. Yeah. You are a lion. Mm. You are a shepherd. You care. Mm. Why don't you think about joining my team? The thing that's holding you back are your sales skills, your real estate knowledge. Come join the team. You come in a few days a week. I could help you. What made you take that? What kind of impact as we wrap up here? What kind of impact? You know, of course, you did join the team. Yeah. Has being you know the real estate industry, a professional real estate team environment here located in Newark, New Jersey. We're selling about 200 houses a year with Keller Williams, yeah. the De Silva team, Key Point Mortgage, the whole nine. You've been exposed. What mm-hmm. kind of impact has this real estate environment, professional real estate environment, has had on you for the past, what, six months? Uh, no, it's been almost a Dece- December 8th. It'll be a year. A year. So oh 10 months. Gosh. Wow, this guy's up for review. This guy's up for a race. Watch out. Yeah, um, yeah watch out. Uh, Tao. Tell on why I see. But um, what kind of impact? I mean, environment, and I tell this to everyone who will lend me an ear, environment is literally everything. It's everything. Mm. Like, I think you could literally take, like, a homeless person from God knows where, anywhere in America, anywhere in the world, and put them in the right environment, and they'll become a killer. I agree with you. Um, so a killer in a good way. In, a, in, a, in the best way possible. Okay. So, yeah, the, the, just being around, obviously, you and then being around the people that you've poured into and have poured back into you being on this team um, has just been, like, invaluable to me, right? Like, it, being able to f- – because I was at a point in, in the city, and I'm, and I'm still kind of there. Like, I don't really have friends in the city anymore. I have people, like, I grew up with, middle school, high school, and, like, old relationships, but I don't keep in touch with them because, like, I just wanted to find my people and – you gave me an opportunity to, to be with my people, right? Be with the people who are mm. obsessed with real estate, who are obsessed with mm. creating a, a better life for themselves and their families. And um, obviously, I just want to say thank you, you know, oh, as, as human to human. I don't want to get too deep here. Honored. But um, yeah, every, every, like, no matter what stratosphere I get to in the real estate world, you can say that the first, my introduction to real estate has been with you. Every dollar I've ever made in real estate has been alongside you. Well, I hope hopefully you make a lot of money outside of me. Oh no, of course, of but course. But the question really is, I want to get very, very direct. Please. As we wrap up, this is a million dollar question. Mm-hmm. How has this real estate opportunity over the past 10 months impacted your personal life? My personal life. For better and for worse. Yeah. It's not all, you know, sunshine and rainbows. You know, I gotta be honest. There's times where I I want to dial on the weekends, right? Because I want to impact more people and I want to impact my life more. And I go, hey, babe, like I'm, I'm going to hang out for a little bit, but I know it's two o'clock on a Saturday and neither of us, you know, have, you know, p- concrete plans, but I want to go dial for two hours. So I'm going to go do that. Right. Um, that's maybe on, on the negative end of like th- this, this is kind of maybe hurting our relationship. But on the positive end, you know, I can treat her to dinner like a few times a week. I can treat us to things. Um, I can there's more flexibility there now, like before. You know, she she wasn't paying for everything, but there were times where I I just didn't have any money, and she would um 
you know, take take the take take one for the team, take a couple for the team. Mm. Um, but as far as like, it, it's it's made me have more of like an abundant mindset, right? So I, I'm just thinking bigger for me, for my future family, for my family now, um, and it just made me more confident. Wow. Yeah, sales in general. I mean, you get punched in the mouth by like homeowners in Newark, obviously, like figuratively speaking or metaphorically for speaking. Yeah, for now, hopefully that doesn't, you know. But uh, it's just, well, you, you feel untouchable at a certain point. It's like, what, what can someone say to me that's going to ruin my day? It's impossible. Mm. What's, what's gonna, what, what is someone going to say to me that's going to ruin my confidence? Wow. I've had 15,000 conversations. I've done the math. 375 times 10 months, four weeks in a month on average. It's over 15,000 conversations. I'm untouchable at this point. <laughs> there we go. Real lives of real estate. It takes your Saturdays, but it makes you untouchable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming on, man. Appreciate you. Thank you for having me. Yes.